speakers are Ben Perro and Daniel Ma, and they both work for Mozilla and they're both systems admin type people and Mozilla gives them the opportunity to work at really big scale and that's really cool, so go. That's true, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, as you can see here, talk, how to use Puppet like an adult, aka Puppet 201. We're assuming a certain level of Puppet familiarity with this talk, uh, as Dan did, so here we go. Okay, it works. <laughs> right, this is us. There's not a whole lot to it. Um, we're both sysadmins at Mozilla. This man has a cowboy hat. He's pretty cool. Um, we're here to talk to you a little bit today about Puppet. There's a few more of us in the audience and around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, some of us are here in this picture. This is not all of us. Uh, notably, I'm not in this picture. So, <laughs> there you go. We use Puppet. We've used Puppet for some time now. That's what it looks like. Not important. <laughs> this is the first good slide. This is sort of the, the thesis, all right? Data, not equal logic, right? It's set, it's not the same. These two things shouldn't collide. What does that mean? No business data should be in modules. Everybody here knows what a module is. I'm hoping, talking about Puppet Forge, talking about making modules, et cetera, and so forth. Business data shouldn't be in modules. All right, that's a bold statement. Maybe they'll never agree with me, but we're gonna talk about why that is. Business logic, that's cool, right? You're talking about workflows. You're talking about how to get from point A to point B. You're talking about one thing should be one way, one thing should be another way that's specific to your business, and that's fine. Modules are a good place to implement that sort of a logic. Modules are a good place to state transition. I was talking about that earlier. And these can be specific to your business. These can be specific to your environment. But remember, these are just workflows, right? These are logic paths. This is not data, okay? Where does the data come from then if it's not sitting in your modules? It has to come from somewhere. We're going to talk about the places it can come from. Data sources. Sometimes you hear things like external data sources, ext lookup, so on and so forth, okay? External doesn't necessarily mean outside of Puppet. It just means outside of modules, okay? So data sources, that's where your data is. Logic, put that in modules. Data, not in modules. Right, uh, so we just talked about where not to put it, where do we actually put it. Uh, the first one, uh, here is Hiera. Uh, the second one uh, that we're going to talk about is PuppetDB. We're going to get into these in a couple later slides. Um, so firstly, uh, with Hiera, it's, you can think of it as like a, a pluggable hierarchical database. So, <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, Right, so you can think of it uh, kind of as a, an external database, external to the modules that you can look things up from. And the cool thing about this is you can have many possible backends. So if you want to write your own based on MySQL, you can. If you just want to have like a, a text file, that's also just fine. So many possible backends. And this is kind of a new feature. Uh, it started in Puppet 3. Uh, so you can get to it beforehand, but it's not built in. It's built into Puppet 3. <laughs> Actually, that's interesting. Um, just to add a little quota to that. Uh, among the many possible backends, first is, is the default backend, which is YAML. Right. So if you're familiar with YAML, if you like using YAML, um, and you should like using YAML, then you're going to like. Uh, how's this pronounced? Hira? 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 I've never heard Hira before. Never heard Hira before? Hira. Hira and Hira. Hira? Hira. 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 English is hard. I don't know how you people speak it all the time. It's ridiculous. <laughs> and here's kind of what it looks like. You do a lookup function, and that's complicated. You could scope it, or you could not. Uh, it'll probably yell at you if you don't scope it, so try to scope it. Yeah, scoping is good. Scoping is where it's at. Used to not have to scope things, and then there's code leaking, and it's no good. Scope things because kittens. Everybody loves kittens. <laughs> Puppet DB. PuppetDB is super interesting. This is another, um, that's a big thing. Okay, right? you could talk, it would be just a presentation on this, frankly. But the important thing to think about PuppetDB, okay, is that it's one of the ways to be used like a high performance store configs. So if you remember 
uh, in your implementation, if you're using implementation, if you're using store configs, store configs are very good. PuppetDB is a way to do that better. Store configs uh, have overhead. Store configs have resource concerns, uh, especially if they're relatively complex. They can take a long time to work through logic trees, and you have manifest compilations that take forever, and so on and so forth. PuppetDB uh, fixes a lot of those problems in really, really interesting ways that are very computer science-y that I don't claim to understand. And it can be used as a high-performance store config, among other things. This is a good place, like Hira, to store business data. It's not in your modules. It's not in your node definitions. Okay? It's still managed by Puppet, and that's a good thing. We're going to see ways that we can leverage that a little bit later. So it's still managed by Puppet, it's still integral to Puppet, it's easy to access, it's easy to play with, but it's not in your modules. As you can see here, if you've ever used store configs, if you've ever used a spaceship operator, looks pretty similar. Right, the next point is where do you find pre-built modules? Uh, let's say you want to do something you think someone's done before you have to deploy a MySQL server or something like that. Uh, it's much better to go find something that someone else wrote than writing it yourself, screwing it up. Uh, learning, you could learn a lot in the process, which is great, mm -hmm. but sometimes you just need to get a module out there quickly and you want to find something that already exists. The first place you can go look, and where we go look when we need something, is GitHub, just like everything else. Sorry, Dan. <laughs> Sorry, Dan. Um, so who here has used GitHub? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, uh, GitHub's where everything is, for better or for worse. Uh, if you're looking for puppet modules, and you should be looking for puppet modules, they're on GitHub. Yep. There's yep. another place you could look. Puppet Forge. Who uses Puppet Forge? That's actually it's not bad. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, yeah, Puppet Forge. The modules on Puppet Forge are a little more rigorous. They require some testing, some things like that. Um, we can get into a little bit of that later. A little bit later, yeah. A little bit later. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> right, they get through a bit more scrutiny. They're usually a bit more stable. Uh, that's about it. Right, so, again, as been mentioned, feel free to write your own modules, right? That's great. You write your own modules. That's fun. But sometimes you got a certain thing, like, you're not the only person in the world that runs Apache. I guarantee it. So out there, <laughs> someone has built an Apache module. Don't waste time. Use theirs. I'll issue this one. This is okay. good. That's good, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the question we have to ask is, is this module right for me? And there's a couple different things that you can ask yourself to see if this is correct. Uh, when you look at a module, is it the right distro? If you're running Ubuntu, is it the same as Red Hat? Or was it developed for Red Hat? Are you going to have to modify this module to make it fit in your system? That's a really tough question. You might want to go look for a different module if you're using something else. Uh, it's also a common reason why people roll their own. Uh, complexity. Uh, is this, if, you can re if you can't read this module in one sitting, you might want to hold off on deploying it until you can. Uh, because deploying something that you don't completely understand is a surefire way of having your infrastructure do something you don't expect. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the third is the popularity. Um, is anybody else using this module? Uh, how many forks does it have on GitHub? Uh, is there good documentation? Is, is someone like Mozilla using this module to begin with? Don't use that. <laughs> <laughs> no, popularity is, is, is a great indicator, honestly. Uh, if you've got uh, a module that's sitting in GitHub, it's only ever had one commit, it's from two years ago, no forks, nobody started it, there's a reason, right? <laughs> Conversely, if it's got 150 forks, it's got a million stars, it's probably not bad. You should be looking into it. Cool. Yeah. You had some ones you recommended. I do. So there are some recommended pre-built modules you can be taking a look at uh, for two reasons. One, because they work. You may have a use case for them today, and you don't even know about it. And the second reason is, is they're good. Download them. Analyze them. Look at them. See how they've been built. Pick them apart. All right, put them in your test environment. Please have a test environment. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and use them as, as a learning tool for making your own modules. So the first one to talk about, Puppet Labs Firewall. It's, it's pretty super. Oh, I know, I know, it doesn't do what you want. And then the, 
the rules get out of order and you can't remove them easily. I know. <laughs> it's not bad. It really, really isn't. They do interesting things with this. Interesting things that you could be doing. Okay? And the second thing is the cloud provisioner. Here is another instance where they're doing interesting things that you could be doing. If only you knew the cloud provisioner module existed. And now you do. I highly recommend you check these two out. But you're not always going to be able to use pre-built modules. It's a fact. All right? Not every business is the same. Not every application stack is the same. Maybe you've got software you've written in-house. Maybe you've got some crazy setup that uses who knows what, and you have to end up rolling your own modules. Well, there's a lot ways to do that, too. <laughs> right. Uh, so there's a couple general rules you want to follow when rolling your own modules. The first is you, you have to make the determination if this is going to be a beautiful and unique snowflake and you're only going to use it in-house and it's never going to see the light of day, then make it as dirty as you want. Nobody cares. But please, 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 if you're going to make it open source, and you should, you should make it as generic as possible. Uh, you should come at it from the standpoint that someone else completely unrelated to you is going to use it someday. It's just a nice rule to follow and it keeps you honest with your own code. At least it does for me. Yeah, that's important. Too. <laughs> uh, the second is please use parameterized classes. Uh, this is a concept we'll touch on in a little bit, but this is a really fundamental part of doing it. It's, it allows you to separate your business data from your logic. It allows you not to have to hard code passwords and other nasty things and modules where they shouldn't be to begin with. SSH keys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the third is just make sure it's documented. Uh, if you use this really cool tool we're going to show you in a little bit, uh, then you have the rubric for the documentation for you. So just follow it and it'll auto-generate docs for you. It's nice, it's sexy, it's required to get into Puppet Forge. Generic, parameterized, documented. Do you do these three things? Your modules are going to be aces. So, well, we're getting there, we're getting there. <laughs> module template. All right. You're figuring this out. I want to roll my own module, but I don't know what the proper structure, what's the skeleton supposed to look like? I know I have to have manifests. And I know there's like templates, subdirectory, and these sorts of things. But where do I start? How do I start? Puppet solve this problem. This, puppet module generate the name of the module. You get that, okay? It's a very, very simple skeleton with the basic building blocks you need to make a module, a sane one at any rate. Tests, spec, a readme, a readme actually gets populated already with the sections you want, a uh, module file, which of course is the descriptor of the module necessary for Puppet Forge, for example, and your root in it, which is empty, although it would be interesting if it wasn't somehow. Hmm. This ties directly into testing, continuous integration, things like that, right? So if you're using a CI system, if you're using an automated test system, you're going to want to have this stuff. Everybody should be doing spec testing. Everybody should be doing spec testing. That's not just a puppet thing. Right, your module will run without most of these, but it won't be useful for anything else without most of these. Right. Right. Uh, on a parameterized classes, I promise we talked to you a little bit about this before. Um, what can I say? They're, they're similar to definitions in that uh, they, they are passed in data, uh, which is about it. And they, <laughs> That's about it. right, it, it's a key of separating data from logic. And this is probably the most important slide in the entire presentation. If you don't get anything else from it, please do something like this. Uh, it looks like this. You can see there are variables. You guys are smart. You're programmers. You're sysadmins. You know exactly how variables work. So using this, you can take the data out of your classes. A um, pretty straightforward thing to do. Again, Ben just mentioned it. This might be the most important slide. I can't, I can't even tell you how important this slide is. If you're not using parameterized classes, and it's scary. Okay. <laughs> Can you give an example? What's that? Can you give an example of like your 10 nodes and what might be different? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, you might have like uh, 10 web servers in a cluster, and they're all serving the same web stack or whatever, but they have to have uh, unique node names. Okay. So don't write 10 manifests, each one of them with one variable that's different. That's the node name. Instead, store your node names in your external node classifier in IRA and whatever, and just pull them in as necessary. And you can do it based on IP address, MAC address, I mean, whatever. Right? That's logic you can code in to the module. Remember, logic's fine. And then pull in your business data from elsewhere. Cool? 
Go good. All right. A couple more difficult things. Not actually difficult, but uh, some interesting stuff. Uh, the first is the style and syntax. You should have a style guide. Doesn't matter what style guide it is. Puppet Labs puts one out. Uh, it's okay. It's, is it still under revision? Did it get released? <laughs> okay. Uh, it doesn't matter which one you use. The important one, the important thing is to have one and be consistent about it. Uh, do you want four spaces? Do you want all your spaceship operators to align? Uh, or rocket op? Are they rockets? Rockets. Rockets. The arrow things. Yeah, the arrow things with the <laughs> equals and the greater than that one. Yeah, those should line up. Those should line those up. Should line up. Yeah. Uh, if you don't have one, we have one. Um, you can use ours. Uh, you can use puppets. Doesn't matter. Yeah. The important thing is to have one. Have a style guide. Who here is a Perl programmer? I am. I love Perl. Perl's great. Who here has written Perl code anyone else can read? You don't get to raise your hand. <laughs> okay. Have a style guide. Super, super critical. Cool. Yeah. Next one. Parser validation. Okay. Uh, you have your source control repository. You've committed your manifest to it. You've committed your templates to it. You followed our rules up until this point. Right? You got your data elsewhere, you got your logic in here. It looks splendid. Everything's lined up, all the arrows are there, your spaceship operator's tight, looking good. All right? Commit. It runs on the client and it explodes. You've got purple lines everywhere. Okay, error this, this, you can't parse this, I don't know what's going on. What's broken? Well, your manifest is broken. But the problem is, is you didn't validate it ahead of time. All right? There are tools that you have on the system right now which you can use to ensure, well, ensure, which are going to help you <laughs> to ensure that your manifests are going to compile and run and you're going to get the expected output before you actually commit and before you explode your infrastructure. <coughs> That's it, right? So if you've got a gem install puppet on your workstation, now you have the puppet executable, puppet parser validate your manifest, okay? And if there's a problem with it, it'll tell you what the problem is. It's the same error message you're going to get when it actually runs on the client, but you don't have to worry about breaking your stuff to figure out that there's a problem beforehand. Clever admins actually put this into commit hooks inside of their version control systems. So for the people who are like, oh, it's just a quick edit, don't worry about it, I'm just get that in there, and they missed a comma, well, before it actually gets committed into version control, they get the error back. That's a good idea. It's a good idea. Thanks, Java. Appreciate that. And it gets rejected. And it gets rejected. That's the important thing. Yeah. Error, error, error. Yeah, but no, no. It's okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> the next point is uh, linting. Like I mentioned, the style guide before. Linting is a way of making sure that all of your code meets a style guide. It's an external tool. It's not official, but it's really widely used. Um, and it's stable. No one has a problem with it. That's what it looks like. Puppet lint, manifest file. Pretty simple. And this is what it's like when your code's bad. Uh, <laughs> your class isn't documented, your lines are too long, you're not scoping variables correctly, and you're using bad quotes. These are the most common errors that you'll see. Right. Uh, you can also, let's say your style guide says use quotes every time. You can pass it a flag to say ignore those type of things. Uh, you can also tie this into your pre-commit hooks on your source control repository if you're pedantic. You should be. <laughs> right. You should be. Uh, as Ben mentioned, the, the really nice thing about this is that it's super customizable. So if you're not using the style guide the Puppet uh, uh, suggests, if that's not what works for you in your environment, Puppet Lint is customizable. Right? You can either do it on the command line or you can use simply YAML file to configure it. Really, really handy. So make it work for your style guide. And then use it, use it, use it, use it. Make it part of you every day. OK. Sort of to switch gears here, we're going to talk about some really cool modules that, that we thought were important enough to mention now. Uh, the first in is in depth, right. <laughs> the, the first is Puppet Concat. Uh, and it allows you to dynamically build text files out of a bunch of different parts. <coughs> so if you have to build a big config file and it doesn't support a .d directory, then you have to have a bunch of fragments and then make a whole file out of it. And this is exactly what this is for. It looks kind of like this. You have a big header. Uh, the order is number 10. And the order of all the files is evaluated 
in obviously uh, numerical order. So you have a header, then you have a body, maybe you have a footer at the end, maybe you have a bunch of bodies that have orders in them. This is how you build good config files for, for daemons that don't support .d directories. The important thing about this, uh, beyond its direct usefulness, which is to say building text files, is that more and more pre-built modules that you're going to find on the Forge, that you're going to find on GitHub, that are very useful to you today, assume you have Puppet, Concat installed already. It's just widely used all over the place. So if you're not using Puppet, Concat now, and you want to start using pre-built modules out there that are really good, now's a good time to start getting familiar with Puppet, Concat. It's used everywhere. Super, super handy. You can abuse it real hard, too. You like build JSON files using Puppet Concat. Like make sure things are tabbed over properly. Yeah. I would never do that. That's that's gross. You're a terrible person. <laughs> yeah. Terrible person. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. The other one is standard lib, and this is uh, actually put out by Puppet Labs, and I'm not actually sure why it's not part of the standard library built in with Puppet, even though it's called standard lib. Uh, it's, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it contains a lot of really useful functions. Uh, standard library, obviously curated by Puppet Labs. It has a lot of useful functions for things like uh, checking if your, if your data is valid. Is this variable a Boolean? Is it an integer? Is it a string? Uh, it has some things for dealing with stages, uh, for defines, and that sort of thing. Functions, types, Functions. yeah, you name it. You can collide hashes together. You can do all sorts of really interesting things with standard lib. Uh, again, it's widely used. So here, more and more modules that are out there People modules on GitHub, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Assume you're using standard lib. Uh, you should be using standard lib. Right. It's super, super handy. I, I cannot stress how much you should be using standard lib. Standard lib is also really useful for sanity preservation, as yes. we mentioned earlier. So you can do things like uh, check if something is a Boolean. Uh, you can do things like uh, have default values for your <laughs> parameterized classes, so which is not something you yeah. should. Oh yes. my god. Oh my god. So, we mentioned parameterized classes. You can have variable names. You can also say variable name equals default value. That way, if you don't have a variable, you get that default value, right. which is really useful for having parameterized classes but still being lazy. The thing about default values is, is they have to be sane, right? So you have to come up with ways that you can structure your module that if someone were to just include that class or, or, or use that module without doing anything magical to it, that something sane will occur. Even if that something sane is an error message that says, you're being insane. <laughs> okay? Default values for everything, even if everything doesn't actually do anything. That's super, super handy. You really would rather have a module not do anything than blow up. I mean, I, mean, I would rather that. Right. Maybe, you, maybe you like things that blow up. When I write modules, I make sure that they can run with completely default values, so if I'm just testing it, I don't need to include any bogus data. Sure. Can you tie in the default values to like system things, or do they have to just be numbers? Can you tie in default values to system things, or can they just be numbers? Default values can be whatever, right? If you're expecting there to be a string, put an empty string. If you don't want to be, all right. If you're expecting it to be a string, you could assign it to false and then have a check that goes, if this is a string, then something. And if it's not a string, because the default's false, then something else. If that would be an interesting like way. A, a memory buffer, though, can you say, like, make it half of the size of RAM? Or does it have to be, like, a number? You can do that. You can do that. You can do that. Yeah, you have a memory size for a fact. And yeah. then you can just do math. Yes. Yeah, you can pull out a factor. That's a really good idea, actually. Damn. We do that for the last <laughs> That's a really good idea. <laughs> I would never. We already do it. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I don't do it. <laughs> I'm going to do it now, though. Verify content. Verify the content. I should have just touched on this earlier. You've got values that are coming into your parameterized classes, your values that are coming into your definition. You don't want to just blindly act on those. That's a bad idea, right? So you've got a configuration file. And that configuration file that you're building with Puppet Concat, key value store, right? You're setting up your keys and you're assigning the values. And you have a particular value that has to be a Boolean, or a particular value that has to be an integer. But somebody in your infrastructure, I don't know, misread the doc because you did write doc, but misread the doc and put a string in there. Do you want to just write that out to the configuration file? Who knows what's that going to do? It could blow up a system fairly easily with that. Verify the content. 
You can also do things, again, specific, this is business logic, an environment where you can set limits on stuff, right? Hit a configuration file for an application, and that application can consume more than X amount of RAM, ever, 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 ever. Or it can't overload this or do more than that. Verify those incoming integers. Set limits on them, all right? It's better to play it safe than to just blithely act on user input. Right, Puppet allows you to just exit and throw an error if, uh, if you have a wrong value for something like a string instead of an integer, which yeah. is useful. Super handy. Mutually exclusive declarations. Mutually exclusive declarations. Again, take an idea of putting business logic in your modules. There are going to be times when you're going to have two logic paths that diverge. If you go down one, then you cannot go down the other. So it's important to build structures into your classes that ensure that when one logic path has been, you start to navigate down it, that you can't, uh-oh, and start navigating down the other. Now this is sort of a floaty idea, but really it comes down to a series of uh, variable verifications and if-thens, right? I mean, we're doing procedural programming, if this, then that, if this, then that, if this, then that. It makes your manifest a little bit heavier, right? There's more layers to it. Maybe it doesn't look quite as concise. But the interesting part about this is, is that you can make very, very, very accurate statements about what you want the module to do and make accurate predictions about what it won't do. Mutually excessive declarations. Again, in a nutshell, using if-thens <laughs> to ensure you get what you want. Fair enough? Cool. All right. Yep. Next point is some useful log output. Um, and Puppet makes this really easy. You don't have to just print things like if you were debugging, I don't know, some PHP or something like that. So you have functions for each log level, and you have all the log levels you would predict. Those are them. They're functions. Well, there's more than this warning error. <laughs> right. These are the ones you could possibly want to use. And you can say, I only want to see errors. I don't want to see warnings or notices. Things like that. Uh, the key point here is to make them informative and human readable. So actually tell, tell yourself what broke and why it broke and do it in a message, do it in a form that you're going to be able to read it when you see it. Or better, do it in a form that other people are going to be able to understand when they see it. So sure. it's nice to have a uh, puppet explode with a purple message and it's an error. And that's good. That tells you something. All right? But maybe it doesn't tell you actually what's wrong. Wouldn't it be nice to be like, you know, this integer is too large. Make it smaller. That sounds way better, way more human readable. You can use the logging functions to do that. Cool. Puppet as a source of truth. Puppet is the source of truth. Puppet as a source of truth. This, again, to switch gears, sort of the third section of what we want to talk about. How much time do we have left? How much time do we have left? Just curious. Nineteen minutes. Nineteen minutes. Nineteen minutes. Nineteen minutes. Actually, it's perfect. Good job. Yeah. Nice. Puppet as a source of truth. This third section we want to talk about is building a puppet ecosystem. All right, or building a system, an ecosystem around puppet. Okay. Puppet is a very powerful tool. There's a lot of information in it, and the more you use it, the more information goes into it, and the more you use it, the more it describes all of your infrastructure, and the more you use it, the more you are going to want to start getting out of it. But how? How do you build an ecosystem around Puppet? What ecosystem? You can use the Puppet Data Library, PDL. Uh, what is the PDL? Uh, PDL is a collection of services with APIs, okay, that Puppet exposes, that you can query, that you can interact with, to get data out of Puppet that you can use outside of Puppet, for example, if you've got uh, an inventory service somewhere, if you've got scripts running that are doing enumeration, um, if you're building uh, dashboards, you know, whatever, okay, you can use that body of knowledge that's in Puppet, that extensive body of knowledge that exists in Puppet, <coughs> outside of Puppet. And that's very, very, very powerful. You can actually also use it back in Puppet. That's some Inception stuff. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> we just talked about these. The run report service is also really we useful. We didn't really talk about it. I mentioned no, inventory. I said if you had an inventory service. Ah, but okay. So the inventory service, whoop. <laughs> <laughs> 
you can tag a bunch. <laughs> the inventory service uh, is super cool. So everybody knows Factor, right? Factor? You run Factor on a node, and you get a bunch of information about that node. But say you're not on that node. You'd like to have the Factor information about that node that you're not on. How do you get it? The inventory service. Okay? The inventory service knows the Factor of all of the nodes. That's cool. All right, you can do crazy good stuff with that. All right, just let the wheels turn on that one. Okay, you can build all sorts of external applications that know all the information the puppet knows about the nodes, graphs, charts, all the things, the pointy hairs. They're gonna love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. You're gonna be a hero. Right. Uh, the road report service. Uh, well, it's. Not really. Uh, I guess it's self-explanatory a bit. Um, but uh, when Puppet runs, it actually saves the results of those runs in the data library. So you can just go query that, and then you can see 10 servers failed last time they ran Puppet, something like that. And more useful than that, you can see what they aired out with. So this is really useful if you're compiling like uh, email lists, if you want to email system administrators about that. You can also make dashboards around this stuff, which is actually how Puppet Dashboard used dashboard. to get fed. Yeah, Puppet Dashboard. Right. Puppet Dashboard? Puppet Dashboard? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Dan. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly, right? Um, if you're making your own dashboard for you know monitoring Puppet, interacting with Puppet, so on and so forth, these two elements of the PDL are, are all, basically all you need, right? You have how, you, how the, the nodes are feeling, and how Puppet ended up executing on them. And then from there, you're gold, right? Yep. The last point was uh, visualization. If you're familiar with Unix graphing, that's graph is. It just gives you a dot file. And you can go get the function names and function dependent, or class names and class dependencies, and you can kind of look at the structure of it. Oftentimes, you can completely simplify things just by looking at how horrible your graph is. <laughs> Puppet gives you this for free. This is not some crazy thing you need to set up. This is already in Puppet. Puppet will hand you a, a dot dot file. And that dot dot file is going to have all of the different ways that all of your different resources connect to each other. Sometimes horrible, horrible ways. Yep. All right? And it's a great way to visualize uh, your logic paths. Just because your manifest compiles, okay, and you've got the desired output on the machine, the machine is running like you expect it to, that might not be enough, because maybe it took friggin' five minutes for that manifest to compile on that node. Why did that happen? All right? Hard, could be a variety of things. Perhaps one of them is terrible logic paths. This is a good way to, to visualize that. Again, it's all part of the Puppet binary that you have when you do gem install Puppet, okay? It'll spit out a dot file. It's got the arguments for it. Yeah, what's up, man? Okay, so how do you, how do you ask for that? <laughs> how do, the question was, how do you ask for that? Uh, I actually just said that, which was <laughs> if you have the Puppet binary, you know, gem install Puppet, right? And there's, uh, just like we showed earlier with the parser validate, yeah. right? So there's arguments that you can give. Actually, we should add that here. Yeah. That would be a good bullet point. Yeah, that's a good bullet point. It, arguments you pass to the Puppet binary, and then you hand it the name of the manifest, and you get the dot file. And that would be better than the picture, actually, would be the command line. So thank you. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. Yeah. The, the PDL has a lot more stuff in it, okay? We just wanted to focus on a couple of these items because we think they're really useful. You can, you can start building things immediately with this stuff. Some of the other items in the PDL are a bit more esoteric. Oh, I sure. I've got to fix that. That's it? Yeah. yeah. So, the take home. Separation of data and logic. Again, this just comes down to reusability. It comes down to portability. Okay? It comes down to open sourcing your work, which is important. You can't want to put business data inside of your modules and then post those modules to GitHub. Probably a bad idea. Okay? Uh, if you make a module that's way too specific, you're not going to be able to use it again later even in your own environment. And that's not going to help anybody. Separation of data and logic. Yep. Next point is consistent coding standards. Make sure, I, again, we, we touched pretty lightly on this. Or, and uh, yeah, make sure that you have correct syntax. Make sure you're using a style guide. Uh, that's pretty much it. Yep. And additionally, you can leverage an entire puppet based ecosystem. So not only can you apply these classes to nodes, but you can also use that in other parts of your environment. 
So as we said before with the inventory service, you can pull data from these nodes and maybe build, build monitoring out of it yes. or build an inventory service or anything else. Monitoring love. All right. That's the take home. These are three bullet points. Fair enough? Questions? <laughs> Uh, hi. Yeah, so we've moved away from parameterized classes. Um, I know how important you guys... <laughs> I know you guys were saying that parameterized classes were really important and everyone should be using them, but we've moved away from them in favor of having a params.pp yep. inside your module. Yep. Um, and that thing will then do your X lookups or your higher lookups. Um, so rather than having the parameterized class, which is injected with those data fields that you get from external sources, um, we're just using the params.pp. I mean, yep. do you think that that's a better way to work? Or is there a reason why you suggest the parameterized classes over that? The reason I suggest a parameterized class is in these slides. And by the way, uh, this is a good idea. Params.pp is a really, really good idea. All right. So if you're using params.pp, my hat's off to you, sir. It is a good idea. All right. The reason that I chose to go with parameterized classes in these slides is precisely because not everybody is using Puppet 3.0, and not everybody is using Hyra yet, and not everybody is prepared to deal with params.pp and their modules on GitHub. So we're trying to make something that was a, a, a bit larger scope that everybody could ingest. Right? If you're using params.pp, that's a good thing. And maybe we could add a slide about params.pp because that's, that's a good approach. Yeah. So yeah, the reason why we use the params.pp is because you can't have, if you've got two parameterized classes, um, then your thing won't compile essentially. Whereas you can say include class X twice and that works well with the params.pp. You're right. I was just going to add that, you know, looking at, at the Puppet data binding stuff that's available in 3.0, it works a lot more like what you're describing. So that kind of capability of fact-based conditional lookup tied into class parameters um, will just be, it, that's just how Puppet works in 3.0. Yep. Not a reason, who, actually here's a good question. Who here has made the transition to 3.0? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I will that, say. That's I gonna change. Like the first time I asked that question, nobody raised their hand. So, so that's good. I'll say that um, I'm from Mozilla, and we have an amazing setup for our MySQL configurations, and in fact, in the whole servers. We have the package installs, and we have three different packages we use. We might use MySQL 5.1, we might be using um, Percona, Percona 5.1, excuse me, we might be using MariaDB 5.5, we also have um, some Oracle MySQL there. So we can like pick the package, um, whether or not we're going to be running masters and slaves, checksums, all of this is in one manifest, and whether or not it's a backup server, so we have backup servers that have multiple instances of MySQL. And we're doing this all with sane, sane defaults from Factor, right? So we, if we have, uh, you know, what's the buffer pool size? The buffer pool size is 80% of memory or whatever we give it. So we can override that template. And it's really, really sexy. I'm happy to show it to anyone who wants. But it's really, really powerful. Uh, are there any more questions? <laughs> yeah, because I'm rich recently. <laughs> um, you didn't touch on any testing uh, with Puppet, like using RSpec or Cucumber? Was that right. just out of scope in this, or...? Not enough time. Okay, cool. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> that's, that's why I wanted to, like, show, you know, when, when you generate the module skeleton, that there's got the spec file in there and stuff, and I said you should be doing spec testing. Yep. That was my nod to that. I okay. just didn't have enough yep. time. Um, also, are there any buffs on Puppet? I'm sorry? Are there any buffs on Puppet that anyone... Puppet buff? Actually, that'd be good. Is there a Puppet buff? I'd be happy should we do one? one? Is there, yeah. Is there time for it? I don't know. Probably not tonight. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> although it can be because I don't have a ticket to the <laughs> Friday. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe okay. after after this, we can go outside. If anyone do pop off, we'll we'll hook something up. Okay. Cool. Pop it. Pop it lunch. Yeah, I want to see that one too. Nagios. Yeah. Um, if I can edit the wiki, I'll put something on the wiki. I guess. What's it? What? What? That's it. If I can edit the wiki, I don't know if I can. I'll put something on there. Nice. Cool. Okay. Any more questions? More questions? Hi. Hi. Oh, is it on? Yep. Yeah. Um, you sort of were talking about when you're getting modules, you know, if it's not for your um, the distro you're using, then find one it is. We run like a mixed environment and we have lots of 
uh, is it this distro? Okay, this is the package name, you know, yep. a lot of that sort of stuff. Um, do you have any good tips for people like us that where it gets real messy? Yeah, the, uh, the OS type factor. Uh, is, is it just lots of checks for package names yes. for this, for this? So you wouldn't recommend splitting it out to different modules or anything like that? You could, yeah, that's a good approach. Yeah, at some point you're going to run into a bunch of uh, a bunch of conditionals, like if your OS type is this, then install this package. But at some point you have so many of those that you think it's a good idea just to completely separate it into two parts and duplicate a lot of your code. Yeah. And there's no real good answer for that, so try to do one or the other. Refer to your style guide. <laughs> I was just wondering if there's any recommendations about um, external modules in terms of managing upstream changes. I started using modules recently and I pulled one down yeah. and then yeah. I felt like I needed yeah. a yeah. Puppet resource that said go and get the module and keep it up to date for me. There is one. Uh, puppet Librarian allows you to set different uh, sources for where you're pulling your modules from and then it will automatically check them out if you want it to and it will keep them up to date. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. That was good? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.